That's why they keep me around. Guys, if you can't hear me, I've got the Los Alamos cold. Welcome to this morning's chamber breakfast. Wasn't the full moon gorgeous last night? My three huskies were up playing in the full moon until midnight last night. So this morning I couldn't get them to get up. They were like, no mom, mornings are for cats. This morning we're trying to get going quickly because Stephanie has to, Stephanie Garcia Richard, representative, representative, newly elected to another term. Stephanie Garcia Richard has to bail out of here by 8.30. And we've got a, an incredible lineup of speakers after Stephanie talking about several other issues. Um, so we're going to hit it hard right into Stephanie, and then I'll give you all your chamber commercials after Stephanie. <laughs> so let's go right into Benji introducing Stephanie, because Lanel always sponsors our chamber. Yay, Lanel! Good morning, I'm Benji Trujillo. I work at the Community Partnerships Office at the Solomon's National Laboratory, and it is my honor to introduce someone who's does not need an introduction, right? Uh, New Mexico State Representative Stephanie Garcia Richard recently re-elected to another term for representing House District 43. She is now a senior legislator and serves on the majority party. Stephanie is a native New Mexican and lifelong educator who has worked both abroad and in northern New Mexico. Stephanie and her family live in White Rock with their dog Gizmo and cats Sugar and Spice. That's so cute. <laughs> Growing up in Silver City, she learned at a young age the importance of serving others, and she is committed to making sure our communities are prepared and keeping pace with changes for the changes ahead, as well as preparing our children for a promising future. Stephanie went to Bernard College, Columbia University in New York, and followed in her father's footsteps becoming a teacher. Her teaching experience has helped to guide her legislative perspective. As a state representative, she serves on two key com committees for the following. The Appropriations Committee that crafts the budget and the Education Committee that sets education policy. She has made, made education and economic development issues her priority, including fighting for and securing funding for smaller class sizes and sponsoring legislation to help grow the economy. In addition to work in addition, she worked personally on crafting a fix for the Insolvent Scholarship Lottery Scholarship Fund. She was named Mad Legislature of the Year for her work on strengthening DUI laws, and more locally, she was a board member of the LACDC. Please welcome New Mexico State Representative Stephanie Garcia Richard. So I actually do not have a prepared presentation. <laughs> I thought I would give maybe a little introduction based on a question this gentleman asked me about what's the primary challenge you're going to be facing in the 2017 <coughs> legislature. And then maybe open for questions. I don't know, Nancy? Nancy? <laughs> that would be fine. Okay. So, uh, is there anything you need to know about me? Uh, okay. So, um, I do sit on budget and education, but everything now is up in the air. Committee assignments, committee chairmanships, everything like that is currently being decided for the upcoming session. So I actually don't know where I will land. Um, I know. House head chair. I have put in for that, of course, um, but we will, we'll see. That remains to be seen. Um, unfortunately, if I do chair a committee, I will be off budget. Um, so that's going to be someone else's problem to decide and we'll just have to vote on it on the House floor. But let's talk budget a, a couple minutes because that's really probably the most pressing issue that we'll be facing. Uh, you know that we had a special session where we tried to make a $500 million shortfall. We're going into the session, the lowest estimates say with about $150 million shortfall. Now remember, that just means to make us solvent. 
That doesn't take into account building up our reserves, which our, our state has really done well. We've, we've <coughs> always kept a healthy reserve when, when we were able to, um, and that's just good fiscal responsibility to do that. So taking us up to the 150 makeup that we need to do does not does not contemplate um, the percent of reserves that we need to be at, which you know, folks say no, le no, no lower say, than say 9%. So we're not there yet. Um, so what are the sort of short-term solutions or long-term solutions for doing that? And I had a good conversation just briefly with Scott, and we t I told him that um, basically folks are saying, well, we need to raise taxes. And we very well may raise taxes. Um, Representing the district that I represent, it's harder for me to vote for a tax increase. Uh, but we do have a Democratic legislature, and probably some tax increase proposals will pass. Um, whether or not the governor will sign them, she has said that she will not, so that remains to be seen. But we cannot balance a budget on raised taxes alone. It's just like the same people who say, well, you can't, you, you cut until you can't cut anymore. It's the same with raising taxes. You can't just keep raising taxes to balance your budget. So what we need to do really is diversify. We haven't done that well. We are very heavily reliant on one industry, which is oil and gas. Oil and gas, for the meantime, uh, is depressed. Those prices are depressed. And I don't necessarily see them coming back in the way that we have been used to them, in the flush days of the Richardson administration. So I really think that we need to look at other industries, um, renewables, we have great potential for renewables in this state. We have great potential for technology transfer in the state, just because we've got research and development going on at national labs that can be commercialized. So those are two great potentials for us to grow those industries. Film actually is another great potential for us. You know that here in Los Alamos we have a lot of film activity. Um, so I really want to push diversification as a longer term solution than just raising taxes, uh, closing Closing tax loopholes is another probably uh, solution that'll come up this session. And that's all fine and good. I mean, I support those things. It's just that's not a long-term solution to this budget crisis that will not go away this year. It will not go away this year. We have agencies. I mean, Cindy can tell you that higher ed is suffering. Kurt can tell you. K-12. I mean, all of you, God bless you. You've, you've had to deal with the cuts that have come from the state, and we just it's not sustainable. So that's kind of my little spiel about moving forward where I think New Mexico should be going. Um, I can talk education if you'd like. Yes, 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 yes. You have a question, Doug. I do have a question. Uh, I'm, a, a, I'm with an organization that works with youth, okay. and I volunteer at some Rio elementary school okay. in the Española Valley. And last week, we were made aware that there was one from a teacher that there was a youth that was talking about you know, suicide, and so we did a presentation on it. Yes. And we had three of our kids that uh, need, need help, they need, uh, they need grief counseling because they are dealing, and this is, we work with fifth and sixth graders, so you got um, 11 and 12 year olds that are dealing with the loss of a relative, whether it be a parent or a, or to someone in their family and their bloodline uh, because they committed suicide. So what is, what is being done on the state level to get them help? We, we, we would like to know because uh, we know that some of the teachers, I don't know if they if are equipped, are equipped or who do they go to? Okay, so I've worked with a number of people in this room actually on this very issue because the answer to your question about what is being done is not enough. So actually Los Alamos schools uh, did a community survey where they asked about folks' priorities and we talked to parents, business owners, about what are your priorities for, for ch your child's schooling, for, for kids' schooling in, in Los Alamos. And I think either top or one of the top concerns was services for behavioral health, just well-being of students. Because we have not addressed that to the point that we need to. Um, and you know, we have, we have a dearth of behavioral health services for adults, but we also have that for, for students. And what, we've, what we're finding is that um, with the cuts that are coming from the state, so uh, during the special session in September, uh, the state legislature cut school budgets by 2%. Is that right, Kurt? Yes. 2%. <coughs> well, some of the first things to go in that cut 
were social workers. Some school districts actually can employ social workers. They've, they've prioritized that somehow within their budget. We know that th those are desperately needed because you're right, teachers don't necessarily have training in how to, you know, in how to, to help and support a student who has some, some you know, behavioral and mental health uh, crisis issues. And so, and out of fairness to them, they're so busy with the requirements they have to fulfill. Absolutely, they are. And their job yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Out of fairness to them. I mean, them. we used to say, I used to be in a classroom, we used to say, we are nurse, mother, yeah, you know, counselor. Yeah. yeah, for three right. students. Right. Yeah. So, so those resources, I, I'm just going to be real honest, those resources for schools are not prioritized. That is not prioritized in the budget. If a school district prioritizes it themselves for you know locally as a local decision, that's one thing. But it's not like we have a line item in the budget that says you know you can go out and hire a social worker in every campus. We don't we don't have that. We we have not prioritized that. So that's definitely something for us to, to work on. Um, what I can say for Los Alamos at least is that we have you know groups like uh, Juvenile Justice Advisory Board who work kind of on those a little bit more of those wraparound services. We have um, the family service advocates, family resource advocates. Ah, family resource advocates, yes. And they kind of do case management. Um, and so they, you know, they, if I, a student is identified as needing help, they will come in and, and, you know, sort of direct you to the help that you need. So, I don't have a good answer for you, other than to say, I think more and more, Folks are understanding that that is an essential part of education funding. Hopefully. I think so. Right now, we just say, oh, well, you just need your pencils and your books. You need the lights on in your classroom. You need your teachers paid. But we know that there's more to education than that. So. Is there a way to link the, the health department, you know, the state health department? We can talk to you about that. <laughs> we have a whole, we're having a whole issue with that as well. Um, so the DOH actually has an office here, a public health office here. The issue is that they've cut those hours way back. Um, and so folks that are in that industry have been sort of um, rallying together to really put pressure on DOH to say, uh-uh, we need a person here. So, I mean, hopefully we're, we're working on that. that. Sometimes that's just a little bit of you know, pressure and nudging and pushing. Yes? I, I was going to bring up the DOH thing. As yes, As a person who formerly worked for DOH and a research and adolescent being girl health, um, it does actually fall under the purview of DOH as well to look at suicide and mental health and being girl health services. And my impression from being a former employee and then just talking to my friends who are directors of the various regions is that there hasn't been enough funding for DOH that's been channeled in. So when people are leaving their positions, they're not getting filled, at, right? And so I, that was where sort of yes. I was just going to ask about, because it seems like a really important issue for everyone. It, it is a really important issue for everyone. And, kids, right? and that is the issue that we're facing currently, is that the, you know, the, the, the former public health nurse uh, was not able to, to stay. And, she, and so now they're saying, well, we're not just not going to fill that, or we're going to cut it down. I think we're going to cut it down to part time. Not fill it. Not fill it. Not fill it. So yeah, that's that's a huge issue for us here in Los Alamos. Yeah. That that served a very vital need. So we we are um, we're so we are in this budgetary crunch. But you know, Phil just made the argument this morning that the county actually has is an agreement to to subsidize that office. So um, it's not really fair that yeah. yeah that they can just take their, their part of the bargain away. So we are working on that. Um, and, and we know that it's important. Uh, you guys are asking too many hard questions. <laughs> I don't have any answers for your questions other than to say, I know it's a priority. I'm pushing it. What we need to do is make sure that everybody knows it's a priority. Make sure everybody knows the, the um, necessary, dire nature of the need for service. I mean, I don't know if you know about the 15 behavioral health uh, institutions that all had to either shut down or reorganize. I mean, that really set us back. That set us back. And so we are kind of recouping from losing those uh, providers. 
the Affordable Care Act really puts a lot of money into uh, HSD to do behavioral health, but you know who knows about the future of that. So that, yeah, that's something that we all need to really be harping on when we're talking with policymakers, when we're talking with folks that are in charge of budget, is prioritizing behavioral and mental health services. I mean, we know about addiction issues that we have in northern New Mexico. We know about, you know, the sort of stigma on mental health we have here in Los Alamos. So that needs to be something we continue to hammer the, the, hammer the drum on and maybe be creative. I mean, a partnership between Los Alamos and DOH is a great creative way so that DOH doesn't have to pay for it. So. <coughs> feel like I'm not really answering the question. We have to give us information. The next empowering is to know what the resources are or a lack of. So at least we know. I mean, I always say we've got lots of need and few resources. So how are we going to prioritize what we work on, right? I mean, that's, that's essentially the question of the legislature. We don't have a lot, but we have a lot of need. So what are we going to focus on? I was curious, I was interested in your comment that you wanted <clears throat> diversify the industry and the economy in the, in the state. Um, it seems like all too often that comes at uh, the expense of huge tax breaks uh, that will never be recouped. Yeah. And so basically, and it's not just in Mexico. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about that because one of the ways that we incentivize industry <clears throat> to either relocate or grow here is that we give them a tax break. And right now what we're faced with is, and I can't remember the number, they, my fellow legislators always quote it at meetings like this, like there's something like 330 tax breaks on the books. Something like, it's, a, it's a few hundred. Um, we don't know the impact of those on our economy. We have no idea whether or not people are actually growing jobs with those tax cuts. We have no idea whether, you know, we know we're losing revenue, <laughs> yeah. but we don't know what the flip side for us is because basically that's, it's an agreement that you make with industry. If you will build whatever it is you do and hire New Mexicans and bring in dollars from outside the state, we'll help you out on your taxes, right? It's an agreement. We <coughs> haven't done that previously. We don't have metrics in those uh, tax incentives to say, if you don't do what you said you were going to do, you've you got to pay us back. You, Utah has an interesting and I think rational approach, and that is you don't get the tax breaks when you come. You get, you the get tax it when you show your stay. success, and then we give it to you. Ah. Yeah. Hey, how so, novel that is. Yeah. You're right, you're right. And when we're facing that with the, with the incentives we already have on the books, and we're facing that moving forward, and, and some of the things that we're doing, so JTIP, um, you all, economic development people know about JTIP. It's job training in plant. It's basically, uh, the state gives you money. If you say, I have people I need to hire, uh, I need to train, and it's, there's certain uh, parameters around it. They have to be certain wage jobs. They can't just be your, you know, your low-level people. They have to be expert people. And we will subsidize some of that training. And, though, and there are metrics within that incentive. There are metrics within LIDA. LIDA, set, you know, um, LIDA is the Local Economic Development Act. And that says you, you know, have to, uh, I can't remember entirely what they are. I don't think it's economic base. You basically have to bring dollars in that didn't already exist. You can't just recirculate dollars that are already here. Um, so there are, we, do, we are starting to build metrics into incentives, but yes, moving forward, that's what I said before, with the, with the short amount of resources we have, we have to be smart about how we spend them. So if we are going to incentivize an industry, we need to make sure that we get what we want, and maybe first, maybe first, you're right. Liddy. So I, I guess one of the questions I have is I, oh, there are a lot of incentives to try to attract business and bring industry from outside here. And I understand the rationale and, and it, there's some hesitation from me and others, I think, that really see a need for us. We see statistics. We know that the best investment can be made in our own homegrown organizations, in our own local businesses. And it's very, very difficult for a small business that's already here in New Mexico to tap into JTIP because the, um, the application for, process And it's is, for larger... It is. It's for much larger organizations. And so they're not... However, LIDA is... ...towards that. What about so LIDA? What would LIDA's you changing. So there's been a, a few adjustments that have been made to allow for additional opportunities for particularly smaller communities to be able to apply. And so we are moving in the right direction. But I think that there's more that could be done to really try to, you know... I think we need to start helping ourselves before we start trying to find others to bring to our state. 
you know, we, we learned a very, very large and expensive lesson with in Intel. Intel. <clears throat> so that's a fair point. And let me just talk on a, few, on a couple of things about it. Absolutely, we want to grow our own. And legislators know that too, because there have been some proposals to ask our State Investment Council, the SIC, to take our $20 billion investments and to start investing some of them right here. We invest actually all across the world. If you've been to Scotland, to the Edinburgh Airport, that's one of our investments. So we invest everywhere. And what they're saying is we don't want the entire portfolio to go away, but a portion, a percentage, to be invested right here. So that's one way that we are prioritizing local business. But you're right, that the, 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 the playing field right now is not competitive for our local businesses.